now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. One of the most popular radio shows of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell as Amos and Andy. This episode goes back to May 13, 1951, and wealthy Ramona Thompson searching for Andy. Well, we'll see. What that music say? Yes, sir, Amos. That music say good health to all from Rexall. The Amos and Andy Show with Ernestine Wade, Johnny Lee, Lillian Randolph, Roy Glenn, Sarah Berner, Jeff Alexander's music, and radio's all time favorites, Amos and Andy. For the past six months, the kingfish has been stalling off his creditors, but the creditors have grown a little impatient and are closing in. As a result, the kingfish has had to use all his ingenuity to fend off the attack. Uh, oh, Mr. Landlord, uh, uh, yes, well, I'll be here. Not by any time. Uh, incidentally, I got the bubonic plague. <laughs> Uh, hello? Uh, oh, the grocer? Oh, no, no, this, uh, this is George Stevens' brother. Yeah, well, we laid poor George away this morning. <laughs> yeah, well, don't ask me. You just have to get a gopher to serve that summons. I don't know. <laughs> well, Sapphire, that'll hold him for a while. I tell you, George, something's got to be done about it. All these bills we owe, and these poor trades people who work so hard calling up all the time for their money. George, it's a shame the way they has to keep calling up, and you just got to do something about it. Well, you're right, honey, you're right. <laughs> and I'm going to do something about it tomorrow. What you going to do? I'm going to have the phone taken out. <laughs> George, this is serious. The butcher done even cut off our credit. Yeah, well, go to another one. George, we done changed butcher 16 times this year. We can't get no credit this side of the Bronx River Parkway. Now, see here, George Stevens, we can't go on like this. Didn't you see in today's paper there was four pages of jobs being offered? Well, now, listen, honey, I went through that paper with a fine tooth comb. I done checked every ad in that paper. Oh, you did, George? Yeah, and there ain't one of them that would take an old lady like you. (laughs) Now, see here, you just got to get out and get a job, and that's all there is to it. Well, now, wait a minute. Now, let's examine the thing now. Suppose I got a job, and I worked hard, and I was making a good salary. The next thing, you'd be running around with society women, and you'd want a car. On the way to the bridge club, you runs over somebody with the car. Then, while you're neglecting me, I falls in love with my secretary. You jumps off the Empire State Building. The gal's boyfriend finds out about me and the secretary and shoots us both. Oh, I tell you, honey, work is just too dangerous a thing to mess with. <laughs> Van Porter, come in. Hello, Kingfish, and even though you was never experienced the joys of motherhood, may I wish you a happy Mother's Day? <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, but uh, that's mighty sweet of you and all, but you know, I ain't too happy today because, well, I, I got to get my hands on some money or go to work. Money? Well, uh, maybe you could raise a mortgage on this beautiful lodge hall of yours. No, I had a little bad luck the last time I tried that. You did, huh? You see, the bank uh, sent the appraiser over, and coming up the front stairs, the dry rot gave way, and he went right through the front porch. <laughs> he broke his leg and sued us for $3,000. We had to raise three more mortgages to pay off the appraiser, you see. Yes, well, I, uh, say, Kingfish, look out the window there. Look at that 
big black limousine that just pulled up in front of the lodge hall. Mm, yeah, look at that. Boy, to ride in a car that big and long, the fellas either got to have money or rigor mortis. <laughs> hey, Kingfish, look at the old war horse the chauffeur's helping out of the thing. Hmm, look at them furs on that one. And them sparklers round her neck and on her wrists, up her arm. And look at that, will you? I'll say she's throwing off more light than the marquee at the Savoy Ballroom. <laughs> and look at that big sparkler laying up there on the chest there. Hmm. Yeah, that looked like the super chief pulling into Albuquerque at midnight. Look, <laughs> <laughs> Henry, she coming in here, too. Yes, she is. Oh, I know what, dear. Maybe she done run out of gasoline or something. Yes, yes. Now, wait a minute. Uh, come in. Uh, madam, when your jewelry quiets down, can I help you? <laughs> yes, my name is Ramona Thompson, and I was looking for an Andrew H. Brown. Andrew H. Brown. Yeah. Uh, look, madam, uh, among all the chinchilla and diamonds you got on there, uh, you ain't got no summons tucked away on you. you know? <laughs> See here, I'm looking for Andrew H. Brown, and I'm most anxious to get in touch with him. It's a very important matter. Oh, it is, huh? Well, uh, it seems I has heard the name of the stranger you're looking for, Andrew Brown. But uh, then again, uh, uh, excuse me for protruding, but uh, that diamond uh, sitting up on your chest there, the one about the size of a rutabaga. <laughs> Uh, tell me, that, is, by any chance, is that the real thing? Why, of course, it cost $18,000. Well, like I say, I'll have my dear old pal Andy Brown get in touch with you as soon as I can, you see? Well, here's my card with my address and telephone number on it. My name is Ramona Thompson. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. Hmm. No, what do you think of that, Henry? Well, Kingfish, here we was talking about money, and in walks a fat Fort Knox. <laughs> He's interested in Andrew H. Brown. Henry, I always knew that someday my ship would come in, but I never knew it would have a 24 carat poop deck. I never... Uh, good morning, Kingfish. Well, well, come in, Andy, partner dear. Glad to see you, boy. Kingfish, what you up to? Oh, not a thing, Andy, not a thing. I. Just sitting here thinking how, well, how much I done done for you during your lifetime and how indebted you must feel toward me and how if you ever come into any good fortune, you'd be only too glad to reciprocate. It's funny how a fellow's mind will pick a subject at ransom like that. You know? Yeah, your mind ain't picked on that subject at ransom since the time I inherited that $3,000. <laughs> What's up, Kingfee? Well, I, I want to break it to you slowly, Andy. Now, I want you to draw on your imagination, boy. Now, look here. Yeah. Now, you take a bucket of lard. Mm -hmm. Now, that ain't a very pretty thing by itself, is it? No, I grant you that. But if you take that same bucket of lard and drapes a chinchilla coat around it, and then loads it up with 20 or 30 pounds of diamonds, and then drive it up in a Rolls Royce, you has got what the poet Keats refers to as a thing of beauty and joy forever. <laughs> Kingfish, by any chance, would you be referring to a female bucket of lard? And uh, what do the name Ramona Thompson mean to you? Ramona? Ramona? Kingfish, did you say Ramona Thompson? Oh, no. Holy smokes, the big slob done fainted. It looks like there's going to be more money in this thing than I thought it was. <laughs> May 13th, 1951, Amos and Andy on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. May 13th, 1951, Amos and Andy. <laughs> Oh, you be all right, Andy. You coming around. You coming around. Oh, Kingfish. Kingfish, what happened? 
Well, I don't know, Andy. All I done was mention uh, Ramona Thompson and you... Ramona? No, no, no. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, sir. Don't collapse on me again. <laughs> I done sprained my psycho caca jack the last time you... <laughs> <laughs> I take it from the way you've been falling on your face around here that at one time you and this old Ramona was romantically declined toward one another, that right? Yeah, Kingfish. I thought that old flame had really died. But when you mentioned her name there, I realized the pilot light is still burning. <laughs> well, now tell me, boy, uh, how did you ever meet a gal like that? Now explain that to me. Well, what is the story on it? Well, I tell you, it was back when I was about 19 years old. I was spending the summer at that beach resort, Sandy Point. My first day there, I took a run and dive off the pier into what I thought was 20 feet of water. <laughs> I tell you, Kingfish, my head must have driven that iron pilot four feet into the ocean bed. Yeah, well, what happened then, Andy? Well, I come up for the third time, and I was thrashing around in the water there. And I noticed somebody swimming out towards me. Help! Help! Help me! Well, take Help. it easy, big boy. Are you having trouble? Yeah, I was drowning. Yeah, I can't get... I can't get my... I'm going down. I can't... Uh, uh, uh. Hello. <laughs> now, look, just relax and let me get my arm under your waist here. There. There you are. Yeah. yeah. And uh, look, now I'll tow you to shore, huh? Yeah. There. That's better. That's better. Oh, uh, am I holding you too tight? Nope. <laughs> well, uh, is there something wrong? Yeah. How about me towing you for a while? <laughs> now, uh, just relax. Just relax. Mm. Oh, me. I thought we'd never make it to the shore. Now, there you are. Lie down. Easy does it. Now, turn over on your back like this. You've swallowed a lot of water. Now, let me get my hands on your sides like this. One, two, one, two. Uh, what is this you're doing? <laughs> This is artificial respiration. Yeah, well, if this is the artificial stuff, I'd sure like to see the real thing. <laughs> now, just relax. You're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. Well, so that's how you met Ramona Thompson, huh, Anna? Yeah, Kingfish, it wasn't much of a step from artificial respiration to smooching. <laughs> Me and Ramona went together that summer, all that summer. Then she went away, and I never seen her again. Her papa had all kind of money, too. And I got news for you. Ramona Thompson was in this morning looking for you. She was dripping with diamonds and had a car and a chauffeur. She done left a car here with her address and telephone number on it. Oh, you see there, Kingfish? They never forgets old lover boy Brown. Now, slow down, boy. Slow down. Just a minute, lover boy. After all, you know, that was 20 years ago. You mean she has changed? Well, then there you was here that quotation of Shakespeare, that age does not wither nor time destroy a woman's beauty. Yeah, I has heard that. But that boy Shakespeare never got a load of nothing like Ramona. <laughs> In short, Andy, the Mary Mermaid of Sandy Point is now a 300-pound sea lion. Kingfish, you mean that Ramona is that bucket of lard you was referring to? Oh, that's right, Andy, but now listen, I done checked on her. She loaded, she got jewels, a car, a chauffeur, a big east stayed up on the Hudson with a swimming pool and everything. Hmm. And Andy, she's looking for you. That means she's still in love with you. Now think what it would mean if you could marry her. Yeah, but listen, I am still the romantic type. Yeah, well, there'll still be romance in it, Andy, but instead of asking her for a hand, ask her for a balance sheet. That's all you got. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Come on, let's go over and see her. Well, now, wait a minute, Andy. Wait a minute, Joe. What's the matter? I'm just looking at you here. Don't forget she ain't seen you for 20 years, neither. <laughs> in the garden of love, you ain't exactly right off the vine yourself, you know. <laughs> 
Oh, uh, what you mean by that? What? Well, confidential, you look like the Air Force has been picking at you, boy. <laughs> yeah, you was right. When I looks at myself in the mirror these mornings, I'll admit I does have to fight my breakfast down. <laughs> but what can I do about it, Kingfish? Well, then, uh, I think if we pool our resources, we might get somewhere. Now, I'll tell you what we'll do, Anna. Uh, we'll slim you down. Get something to hold your stomach in. Buy you some high-class clothes. With a whirlwind courtship, who knows, Andy? You might be able to sweep off a feet before your girdle breaks and lets the cat out the bag. <laughs> Yes? What is it, Raymond? Uh, Miss Thompson, a uh, Mr. Stevens just called. He says he's located Andrew H. Brown. Oh, fine, fine. Uh, there's just one thing. He said this fellow Brown was looking forward to seeing you again. Andrew Brown? I don't remember knowing anyone by that name. I got this Andrew H. Brown's name from the unemployment office when I told them I needed someone to help out with the gardening. Yes. He should help immensely with the spring plotting. Yeah, just lift your chin up there a little higher, and uh, that's uh -huh. it. Now, who is still there tying the good here for you? Uh -huh. There he is. Uh, oh, boy, got this tie all tied up good there. Now look in the mirror there, boy. Yeah. I'll be my love, I'll be my love. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, how do I look, Kingfish? Uh, oh, you sharp as a tack there, boy. And that frou-frou uh, water you got on yourself there or something, boy. Mm -hmm. That really pings your nostrils, don't it? <laughs> yeah, well, that's my own mixture, Kingfish. I took some eau de cologne and... Blended with some citronella and energy. <laughs> it gives you that clean, outdoor effect. <laughs> and on top of that, while I was smooching, there ain't gonna be no flies crawling around on top of my head, neither. <laughs> oh, you gonna sweep this Ramona Thompson right off her feet, Andy. You know, you really look trim and military in that new suit you got there. Yeah. That motorcycle belt that you was wearing under your shirt really hold in good there, too. <laughs> That's a dog, ain't it? Oh, yeah. You know, and uh, this proves that you is really the lover boy of all times. This gal remembering you after all these years. Oh, listen, Kingfish. When a gal goes with me, it's like the cowboy that sat on the hot branding iron. He might have not enjoyed the experience, but he carried a tender memory for the rest of his life. <laughs> yeah, and uh, she is still Mr. Ramona Thompson. Uh. Now, you know what that means, Andy? That must mean that she is not only looking for you for but one thing, Andy, and that is wedlock. Wedlock, huh? Oh, yeah, and don't forget, I was locked in there with you too, boy. <laughs> we gonna make a charming quartet. Me, you, her, and her money. Oh, we gonna... <laughs> Just one thing, Kingfish. You think it was a good idea us sending that lawyer of ours, Calhoun, up to see her? Oh, yeah, Andy. As your lawyer, you see, he can put the whole thing on the legal basis. Yeah. Then after the marriage, we won't have no trouble slapping the hapless cappers on the money. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Is that what we do? Well, look here, look here. It's four o'clock now. Calhoun should arrive at Romo or Ramona Z State by now. And you know, when that boy talks to her, everything is going to be all set. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes. What is it, Raymond? Uh, there's a person outside to see you. He says his name is Algonquin J. Calhoun. Calhoun? Calhoun? I don't know anybody by that name. What does he look like? Well, I say, madam, he's rather hard to describe. He looks a little like the man who came when the cat died. <laughs> <laughs> he says he's here about Andrew H. Brown. Andrew H. Brown? Oh, yes, yes. He's the man that's going to help out with the gardening. Send Mr. Calhoun in. Very good. Uh, right this way, Mr. Calhoun. Uh, thank you, boo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Madam, I'll 
is here on behalf of my client, Andrew H. Brown. <laughs> and I want to say on behalf of Mr. Brown that... I'm over here. You're talking to the grandfather's clock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me get my bifocals on here. <laughs> there we is. Now, that's better. Now, madam, let me say to you that, uh... Uh, What's wrong? I think I'll go back and talk to the clock. <laughs> this ending is not going to be pretty. May 13th, 1951, Amos and Andy on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion follows these messages from your favorite radio station. For a very long time, you've heard me talk about my pillow, and of course, the my pillow products are fascinating. My slippers, which are on special right now, uh, all of the sheets and the pillows and the pillowcases, and all the wonderful things. But did you know that uh, American entrepreneurs have gotten together with Mike Liddell to form My Store, a whole line of products uh, made by American entrepreneurs including health products, garden and patio, food and drink. If you're a coffee drinker, check out some of the coffees they have there. Uh, beauty, bath products, personal care, things for your pets. Check out mystore.com. That is mystore.com. And, of course, when you use my promo code, which is Wyatt, that's W-Y-A-T-T, you can save yourself a good bit of money on anything there. Check out mystore.com, promo code Wyatt. Seems like Andy's old flame done fizzled out. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, Amos and Andy, May 13th, 1951. See here, what is it that you want? Well, madam, to get right to the point, I done come here to talk about Andrew H. Brown. Andrew H. Brown, a man who was a sterling citizen, an upright gentleman, and an outstanding pillar of society, with all the charm and attributes of a bon vaillant. In short, madam, you ain't getting no smoke. <laughs> well, I'm sure that Mr. Brown and I can work out a suitable arrangement. <laughs> I'll get you, you old rascal, you. <laughs> well, you have Mr. Brown here at 9 o'clock sharp tomorrow morning and have him report to Raymond and he'll tell him his duties. Report to Raymond? <laughs> Explain his duties? Listen, madam. With Andrew H. Brown, you getting a boy that don't need no lessons. Now, <laughs> see here, what is this all about anyway? A man sending a lawyer just to see about a job as an assistant gardener. Gardener? But Andy Brown is your old flame from Sandy Point. What is you talking about, you little shrimp? I never heard of Andy Brown in my life. Now, wait a minute, Jill. Wait a minute. <laughs> Didn't you used to live in Sandy Point? Sure, we went there every summer. My papa had a big house on the point. Well, then don't you remember Andy Brown? He hit his head on the steel pilot and, and you pulled him out the water. Listen, that summer I was looking for a husband. Oh. I was a champion swimmer and used to get on that beach and stay from dawn till nightfall. Oh. That summer I pulled everything out of that water from a nine-month-old baby to a 12-foot barracuda. Oh. <laughs> I don't remember no Andrew H. Brown. I was looking for some extra help and got his name from the unemployment office. Now, you get out of here before I have my butler throw you out. All right, madam, all right, I'm going, I'm going. But there's just one more question I want to ask you before I leave. What is it? Madam, is you married now? No, I ain't never been married. I thought so. With that face of yours, you should have settled for the Barracuda. <laughs> Oh, uh, yes, Andy. I tell you, Calhoun will have everything smoothed out for you, boy. Oh, yeah. I bet she's on her hands and knees right now begging him to get me to marry her. 
Oh, yeah, you see, by sending Calhoun over there, that's one of the smartest things we done ever done. Yeah, indeed. See, he being a lawyer, he can go over there and twist her in the notch, you see, because yeah. women don't know how to act. Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, hello? Kingfish, Kingfish, this is Calhoun. Oh, yeah, yeah, how'd you make up? Kingfish, I got bad news for you. That old toad don't want Andy's no husband. <laughs> she don't even remember him. She got his name from the unemployment office and wants him as a gardener. Mmm, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Tough luck, and I, I'll call you later. Okay. Well, like I was saying, Kingfish, when a gal once meets me, she remembers me till the cows come home. <laughs> Andy, I got news for you. It's roundup time in the old corral. <laughs> Kingfish, I don't like the way you was looking. You got the same expression on your face as you did the day the doctor told you that your mother-in-law was going to live. Oh. Well, lover boy, there's been a little hitch. Hitch? You mean everything ain't all right with me and Ramona? Well, then, uh, you know how we was quoting poetry before? Yeah, I remember. I assure that you was familiar with the words of Robert Burns about the best laid plans of mice and men. Mm, yeah. Well, you and the rats is in trouble. <laughs> Andy, the gal don't even remember you. She ain't got no idea who you is, don't know nothing about you. She wants you as a gardener. What? She forgot me? She want me as a gardener? Me, the Don Juan of Lenox Avenue spreading Vigoro? <laughs> yeah, well, that's how it is, boy. I guess you ain't the man you thunk you was. You walking around here all the time saying, ha, 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 they never forgets me and all that stuff. Listen, Kingfish, she done loved me once. I ain't taking this thing laying down. I'm gonna find some way to prove that Andy Brown is still the great lover. <laughs> That's a great idea you got for winning Ramona Thompson back. Oh, yeah. I told you I had brains, Amos. Ha! 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 Well, after hearing this idea you got, you know, I inclined to believe you. Oh, yeah, Amos. You see, Ramona is a champion swimmer. And if she sees somebody in the water, she can't help going for him. Yeah, son. Uh, if she pulls you out of the water again, she gonna fall in love with you all over, huh? Oh, yeah. It's working out fine. You see, she got that big swimming pool on her east state. And I done found out that she has supper on the terrace every night. So I'm going up there this evening, and I'm going to throw myself in the swimming pool and holler for help. Yeah, then she pulls you out of the water and falls in love with you all over, huh? Yeah, I'm going to way up in the air, do a jackknife, and make a big splash so she'll hear me. Yeah, that's the stuff, boy. By the way, Raymond, what time is it? Uh, just nine o'clock. I'll have my after-dinner coffee out here on the terrace. Very good, madam. Oh, oh, by the way, the painters will be here tomorrow, so I did exactly as you instructed. I drained the swimming pool this afternoon. <laughs> I feel so sad for that swimming pool going to get cracked. Uh, May 13th, 1951, Amos and Andy on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now our thanks to Ted at RadioMemories.com for another episode of Lum and Abner. We're going back to uh, 1935. This particular episode from May 13th of 1935, as they continue to try to figure out what to do with the hogs that are coming in from this chain letter.
everybody. Here we are all ready to take you down to Pine Ridge for another visit with Lum and Abner. Brought to you by the makers of Horlicks, the original malted milk. And now, let's see what's happening down in Pine Ridge. Well, Lum and Abner learned the other day that it was unlawful to start a chain letter. But only after the hog chain letter that they had started and spread like wildfire. <laughs> well, now the old fellows are trying their best to get the thing stopped. However, they're finding it much easier to start than it is to stop. As we look in on Pine Ridge today, we find Lum and Abner down at the Jot'em Down store. Lum is talking over the telephone. Listen. Uh, Luther? Uh, this here's Lum Edder. Why, oh, tolerably well. How's yourself? Ah. Uh -huh. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it must be ailing. Why, well, Luther, what I called you up about, uh, you got one of them hog chain letters that me and Abner started, didn't you? Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah, you was one of them that give us a hog, wasn't you? Yeah, I know he was. I recollect seeing you. Yeah, well, Abner thought he recollected seeing you bring one over there. Yeah, I brought a little pole and shiny over. Well, I wish you'd go over there at his place and pick it out and take it back home. Fresh out about a hundred pounds, I reckon. One bacon. Ah. Yeah, we're giving them all back. Yeah, we we found out uh, that that uh, it's again the law to start them chain letters that way. Why, using the mails to defraud or something like that. Dick Huddleston was a telling us. Yes, sir. Huh? You have? Well, for the land sake. He says he's got over 400 hogs just in today himself. Uh, his name must be up at the top of the list and on it by this time. And how's that, Luther? Well, we just figured if everybody would take their hog back, he'd stop this chain letter we started and get us out of trouble. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, all right, Luther. I don't know as I blame you much. No, I don't reckon they could get you. You never started it. All right. Goodbye. What'd he say, Lom? Just what I thought he'd say. Huh? Just like all the rest of them said he didn't want his hog back. Looks like we've started something here we can't stop. Well, I don't know what to do. Uh, got to get them hog back somewhere or other. That penitentiary is staring us right smack in the face. Trouble is, everybody around here knows that me and you's the only ones that can get in any trouble over it, and they ain't trying to help us. Why, no, they don't care where we go to the penitentiary or not. I was talking to Jerry Hausner about it, and he just come right out flat-footed and said he wouldn't have his hog back. Yeah, I know, yeah, he's the stubbornest fella I've ever seen anyway. I think he's kind of crazy myself. Yeah. About the best thing for us to do is just get a truck somewhere and load them hogs up and drive over to their places of a night and unload them where they belong into their feller or not. Yeah, but the trouble is, Lom, we don't know where they come from. There was so many folks bringing hogs over there for a day or two that I couldn't keep up with them. I don't know who brung them and who didn't. Yeah, that's right. We ought to have made out a list of everybody that brung us one, and we'd have known who to take them back to. Yeah, but we... Never know then that we'd want to give them back. Yeah. They never knowed what they were doing, did they? Huh? Oh, nothing. Granny to wish them hogs could talk and tell us where they live at. <laughs> Might talk pig Latin to them, Lom. <laughs> Do what? Talk pig Latin, you know, egg pay at and lay. Oh, for goodness sake. Here I'm trying to study up some way to keep us out of the penitentiary, and you sit around and think up a bunch of foolishness. <laughs> well, I was just joshing off. <laughs> I know better. I know that they couldn't understand that kind of talk. I can't hardly understand it myself. <laughs> I know I've got more sense than pigs. I, I wish I'd never heard of a chain letter. They say some fella out in Colorado started them things. Yeah. That yeah. is for money. Of course, it was our idea changing it to a hog chain letter. Well, what we going to do, Lum? I told Elizabeth I'd be back in a few minutes, and she said if I don't get them hogs away from over there by this evening, that she's going to run me and them both off. Well, you better get started running, then, for we ain't going to get them away from there today. I can tell you that right now. Well, uh, why can't we just go ahead and put a fence around that 80 acres we bought down on the river the other day, Lum, and turn them loose on that? Well, what's the use of going to the expense of fencing that place up if we ain't going to keep the hogs? Well, we've got to put them somewhere. They're just ruining our place over there. Looks like a cyclone had hit it. 
I've got Cedric staying over there now to keep him out of stuff, but I don't think he's able to do it. There's so many of them. Yeah, I granted there's another thing. We ought to quit selling them over there. Why, sure, that'll be worse off than ever if we don't uh, stop taking folks' money for them hogs that we got that's supposed to be again the law. If we start trying to get them hogs back, no telling where we would find them at. I know, they change hands 15 or 20 times by now. Selling them for $3 and no telling what they'd want for them back. No, no. Maybe we could start an unchain letter. Do what? An unchain letter. Start a chain letter where everybody would give somebody a hog, we'll have to go get it back. Yeah. That way, eventually, the hogs will all get back to where they started from. Yeah, that's a good idea if they'll do it. Well, it ought to be a heap easier to get somebody to go get one back than it was to get them to give one away. Yeah, but what about that using the mails to defraud that Dick was talking about? Well, let's don't get no more of these things started through the mail on. Well, it oughtn't to be again a law to start an unchained letter. Well, you better ask Dick about that. Granny's, wait a minute here. That is a good idea. That's a good idea even if it won't work. A good idea if it won't work? Why, sure. That way we won't have to send the hogs we got back to where they come from. Because, uh, well, like if they was to send us to the penitentiary for ten years for starting them chain letters... It ought to take about ten years off for starting an unchained letter, so we can't get no more trouble over the deal. We just break even. Yeah, well, I'd rather stop fooling with these chain letters long before we end up on a chain gang somewhere. <laughs> oh, <not Yeah>. really. <laughs> We're what you call fugitives from a chain letter, ain't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come to think about it, though, I don't believe that unchained letter business will work very well anyhow, Abner. I don't need that. See, we never got all the 15,625 hogs we're supposed to get. We might have to go out here and buy up to a 3,000. That is, if we start an unchain letter and run it backwards that way. Oh, well, my goodness, I know we don't want to do that, Lum. Have to buy up a bat. No, if we can just get them hogs over there back to whoever give them to us, I hope I never see another one as long as I live. Yeah, but that ain't as easy done as it sounds, old Lum, giving them back. Reckon them hogs would know their way home if we was to just turn them loose. You mean just turn them loose and, and let them go home by themselves? Yeah. Dogs and cows and stuff like that will. They will. Cows will always come in at milking time, you know. Yeah. Well, I don't know about hogs, though. I reckon they would. Well, we'd get shut of them anyway. Yeah. If the post office department comes down here to investigate who started these chain letters, they couldn't prove nothing on us if we never had no hogs over there. Well, if we don't do something about it pretty quick now, Lum, we won't have a chance to turn them loose, for Elizabeth's going to do it first. Yeah. I believe that's the best thing for us to do, Abner, just open them gates and let them go. Yeah, I better answer the phone. I think that's our ring that just rung. Now. It was. I never paid no attention yeah, to it. Yeah, I believe it was. Hope that ain't none of the post office authorities here now. Hello? Well, tell me who you want first. Yeah. That's who it is, that's sort of a giver well, man. Who is this talking? Well, I can maybe a president himself. You sure about that? Ah. Uh, well, all right, yeah, this is half of us. This is Lum Eddards talking. Oh, <laughs> they know what it meant. <laughs> You've got what? Oh, my goodness alive. Abner, that's the express company in there at the county seat. Says we've got 36 hogs in there at the express hall. You mean that they broke out and went clean in there? No, no, there. These are some that's been shipped to us. Oh. Wait a minute. Hold the receiver a minute. Uh, me and Mr. Peabody's will have to have a little meeting over this to decide what to do. What, what, what do you mean? What do you, what do you want to have a meeting for, Lon? Well, if these hogs that start getting coming in from out of town, we air into it now, sure enough. Well, just tell him that we don't want them. Tell him he'll have to ship them right back to whoever they come from. Tell him we've got more hogs now and we know what to do with Trouble is, we'll have to pay the express back on them. Well, I'd a heap rather do that than go to the penitentiary. Yeah, I don't know. Wait a minute. I'll find out how much it'll cost to ship them back. Yeah, tell him we never ordered them in the first place. Hello? Mr. Uh, Mr. Express? Uh, <laughs> uh, why, couldn't we just leave the hogs in the crates they come in and ship them back to whoever it was sent them to us? That's the thing to do. Uh-huh. Well, how much would that cost? Just the same as it cost to ship them to us, huh? All right. Well, uh, how much would that cost us now altogether? Well, figure it up and call us back, will you? Yeah. All right. <laughs> much obliged to you. 
Law, he, yeah, man, that's going to cost a fortune sending all them hogs back. It is. He says some of them from New Brasky and California and Pennsylvania and all over the United States. Well, for goodness sake. Oh, me. Wait a minute. Uh, what's that Cedric doing coming over here? I told him to stay over at the place. Hey, Mr. Abner, you better get on over at your place. What's the matter, Cedric? The hogs ain't got out, have they, Cedric? Well, I wouldn't worry about that, Lom. He's aiming on turning them loose anyhow. No, but uh, your names must be at the top of the corn list now for... Folks is bringing corn over there so fast I don't know where to put it at. Corn? Uh, Granny Zabner, I forgot about that dead blame corn letter we started. Now we air into it sure enough. <laughs> it was a bad day for Lum and Abner when the chain letter idea hit Pine Ridge. This is Carlton Brickert speak, speaking for Lum and Abner and Horlicks, who now bid you all good night and good health. Well, the corn's as high as the pig's eye. <laughs> May 13th, 1935, Lum and Abner here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day. Would you please visit Ted at radiomemories.com? He supplies shows on cassette, CD, and flash drive for your computer. That is radiomemories.com. Radiomemories.com. Also, please thank this station, support their advertisers, their kindness and courtesy. Allow us to be with you each and every time you roll around here on your favorite station. Miss a day? You don't have to miss a show. All of our shows are available on demand at ClassicRadio.stream. That's ClassicRadio.stream. 21 hours of Classic Radio Theater each and every week. They're also available through download through podcast sites, and they are listed there at our webpage as well. You can also learn about building a Classic Radio collection of your own. You can find our social media links, and you can buy me a coffee. That buy me a coffee money helps us to acquire additional Classic Radio collections and help us maintain our distribution links. That's classicradio.stream. Thank you so much for tuning in. Tell all your friends the greatest radio shows of all time are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. <laughs>